conscious that you're going to be stranded in the car, but the only way to bring back the train. Start that again. Don't worry about the board member, just operations yeah. and engineering. Operations and engineering. We're at Puffin Billy today. John Hoy is going to take us around and show us some of the locomotives. He's a manager of operations and engineering bloke. That'll do. <laughs> I can't oh, hurry up, because the train's right, right. going to go. He's, all right. he, 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 he's, he's an operations right. and engineering manager. Yeah, right, right. Here we are today at Puffin Billy Railway. I can't say it, but John's going to tell you. John, who are you? Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm, the oper I'm the operations and engineering manager for the railway, and it'll be my pleasure to show you around. Is, is that, oh, that is was that, perfect. That, that yeah, right? that was perfect. Good. Thank you very much. This is our uh, 1926 uh, Bayer Garrett Peacock. Uh, it was uh, it was built in 1926 and imported to Victoria to operate on our narrow gauge. And the intention was that it was to eliminate the use of double heading locomotives which had been a practice as the loads got heavier and heavier. Um, the Laco itself we restored some 10-11 years ago at a cost of about 1.75 million dollars. Uh, 27 years it took us um, and here it is today. We uh, use it when we have extra loadings and special events and that sorts of stuff. Um, wonderful piece of English engineering and um, as you can see it has it has the early 260 wheel arrangement um, plus 260 at the back um, which makes it a four cylinder engine coal fired um, very very reliable piece of equipment um, and uh, yeah it's our uh, it's our big toy so to speak um, what coal are you using in this job we're using coal from Clarence uh, and and also from uh, uh, um, Flair Athelene in the Queensland okay any idea of the traction effort of the, the locomotive compared to... 26,500 pounds of tractive effort. Every time I get the opportunity to drive it, I think how wonderful it really is. I'd be probably one of the few blokes in the world right at that point in time operating a Garrett. This particular engine, just for interest's sake, was uh, run by the Victorian Railways and when it was withdrawn it was stored pending scrapping. It had a sister engine, G41. And uh, this one survived the scrapping and it eventually found its way to our museum at Menzies Creek and uh, we ultimately decided to embark on a path of restoring it and uh, through the assistance of the Puffing Billy Preservation Society um, we managed to get the thing to where it is today. Okay John, what's this? This is our South African Garrett, our two foot NGG16 Garrett that we're currently, we've regaged it to two foot six who are in the process of building. Take the clothes off, you could be in this. <laughs> <laughs> and John is just stood in front of the wheels which are eventually end up on the locomotive we've seen behind us. John, take it away. Yeah, these wheels here, disregard this, they're just carriage wheels. These are the driving wheels here for the, uh, for the NGG 16. And where are we hiding the engine wheels? Down the back. We'll have a look at that shortly too. The other thing we've got over here is the brand new boiler for the NGG16 that we had uh, built by E.R. Curtain and son up in New South Wales. Um, this is the boiler which we were just talking about. This little innovation here where originally these NA locomotives in order to work on anything in the smoke box you had to climb into a very confined area. So we made them so that the funnel on the top of the smoke box could be detached so that we could gain access and you'll see if you look here, over here at 6A um, how easy it is now to get in and actually work on the particular locomotive and if you come around the front you can see how cramped it would have been for somebody who was squeezed in there to uh, to actually work on them. Ah now here's a, here's a bit of interest for you and you can see the limp in there where, where it's, it's actually in for a, a D exam and we've um, we're doing some work on it. Um, this is locomotive 6A which is quite unique in our fleet. It's fitted with a Lempor exhaust system which you can see the Lempor sitting in there now. It's actually in for a C exam and uh, yeah we're sort of pulling it apart and doing a bit of work on it. He's a, uh, a long serving valuable member of our staff. John could you explain this piece of machinery to us? 
Uh, yeah, th this is our wheel turning lathe and we can do wheels up to uh, six foot four inches in, in diameter. We're, we're only in, in feet and inches here because it's a uh, heritage railway. Um, we purchased this from the New South Wales Government Railways who are about to scrap it and we paid virtually nothing for it and uh, it's serving its purpose as it always intended to. Thankfully a piece of machinery which is saved for our future. Yeah, one of the remarkable things about it, it was actually overhauled and never used. So we've got ourselves virtually a, uh, a reconditioned lathe. I mean, it was overhauled and then it was marked, earmarked for scrap. It's in fabulous condition. When was it made? Uh, 1940s. John's just going to introduce us to the 8A VR made in 1908. John? Yeah, this is... Uh, this is one of the, uh, the, the more interesting of our, our um, NA fleet. Um, it's got a slightly different uh, uh, smokestack on it, you'll notice. The Victorian Railways actually used the, the narrow gauge railways in Victoria as test beds for various thoughts that they had about new equipment in production. So uh, automatic signalling, modified front ends, speed recorders, electric headlights, all of that stuff was trialled on the narrow gauge before it, uh, it went onto the broad gauge. So um, this engine here has got a slightly different front end to all the others. Um, it's, a, it's a master mechanic front end instead of the standard uh, NA type front end. So you'll see later on we'll, we'll, we'll find that the uh, tape and smoke stack off it and you'll see what the, what the design work is. And, and the net result of that, instead of having those wonderful chimneys that all the early locomotives had, they all ended up with this uh, standard uh, uh, tape and stack that um, look, simply looked ugly, but effective. This is some of the restored engineering, and as you can see, it's absolutely beautiful. A fantastic condition. This is what your donations to these railways do. No, you're right, Zach. Stay right where you are. This is interesting because... Uh, I can't get it open any further. This was an engine where they, uh, they worked on basically a modified front end, which they found was successful. Uh, it was the forerunner of the master mechanic front end. It was successful, so they converted then all of the Victorian Railways engines over to what we call master mechanic front ends. They allowed, they, they actually referred to them as basher front ends because they allowed the engines to be worked harder and more efficiently. Um, but again, they tried it on 8A and then as a result, all the Victorian Railways classes of engines, the Ks, the Ns, the Xs, uh, all came out with this type of front end. You can clearly see the extension, which runs from here up to Zach's feet almost. And so what do we have in front of us here? This is our regaged NGG16. We've taken it to 2 foot to, uh, to uh, 2 foot 6. Zach's determined to drown me out. And what it's involved doing is actually stretching the frame out to do from uh, 2 foot to 2 foot 6, which we've, which we've, which we've done. And we're now in the, in, the, in the throes of assembling it, getting it ready to have the wheels put in underneath. And uh, that'll be the first engine unit. The second engine unit is due here probably the end of the month. At that stage, we're proposing to move the whole unit off site and move it off site and then bring it back in. As you can see from the workshop, we're, we're a little bit strapped for space. John's just going to talk us through this locomotive. This is a, an 1880s de Corbel, and there were in fact two of these plus a, a, a Peckett locomotive that worked for the uh, Melbourne Gas Works. And uh, when they were all taken out of traffic, we eventually acquired the three of them. We've got the Peckett, which is operative up at, up at Emerald, and we've got the two De Corvals. This particular 1880s one here, we're doing up exactly as it would have been in, in 1880. And uh, this is a volunteer project. So when the volunteers come in on a uh, Tuesday or a, 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 a Wednesday or a Saturday, they basically work on this. We've had a complete brand new boiler built for it. It's privately owned, it's part of a collection owned by a gentleman called Colin Rees, who has it on, uh, on um, loan to us, and um, we share the expenses of running the thing. And I think the expenses probably end up a little more my way than his, but you know, we're so grateful to be able to have these engines and use them. I see you've you bought your English summer with you, I see. <laughs> this is Geoffrey working on a part being used on what loco, John? No, this will be for carriages. Oh, this is, ah, it's a right, carriage right. axle, a carriage axle for one of the carriages. They're also restoring a number of carriages here. How many carriages? We've got, we've got uh, 
48 pieces of rolling stock in total. 48 pieces, that's a lot of rolling stock. Okay, John's just going to talk us through this loco a bit more, get you a nice side-on view of the 8A. Take it away, John. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's very interesting with these engines, you'll notice this particular loco here is 107 years of age. What's significant about this? When these engines were built, they were designed for 20-year life and throw away. So by 1920, it should have almost been on its deathbed. The, originally, there were 17 of these. Um, and as I say, they were a Baldwin-built engine and then we copied them. The first two came from Baldwin and the rest were actually built at the Victorian Railways workshops at Newport and they were a copy. Um, and by a little bit of what we'd probably call sheer arse, um, a handful of them survived and we managed to obtain them and um, yeah, there, there it is today doing the job that it was designed to do in 1908. Thank you, John. These engines, when, they, when, when we first took over running them, they were fairly run down and not exactly what you'd call reliable, but over time we've, re, we've, we've rebuilt them and built reliability into them. They're quite remarkable in, in that they now run, we run 364, uh, 364 uh, days a year. Um, we have Christmas Day off, but I think there'll come a time when we'll even run Christmas Day. We'll probably have the Christmas barbecue on the train. Um, and the remarkable thing is these little things here actually carry the fleet day in and day out. The five of them that we have operating, when you think about it, 364 days a year carrying 350,000 passengers and this railway currently employs the equivalent of about 65 full-time staff supported by 900 active volunteers, not all of whom are here at once, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable from where it's come from to where it is today. Excellent for the local econ economy as well. Oh, certainly that. I mean, we've, you know, I mean, we use a whole heap of local suppliers to, because uh, as you can imagine, nothing for these little things is now bought off the shelf. And uh, yeah, we certainly, uh, certainly use a lot of local suppliers, and uh, yeah, it's you, very good. If you would think about things a bit deeper, the people that visit the railway buy ice creams, book hotel rooms buy petrol, etc, etc. These railways are certainly bringing life back into areas. Yeah, it's, it's also interesting, when this railway was initially set up, it was designed to bring produce out of the hills. So it bought, uh, if you go down to Nobelius, at one stage of the game, when, when, when Nobelius was in its heyday, it was the largest nursery in the southern hemisphere with the plants that it grew and it exported to the rest of the world. Later on it found fame when the Dandenongs were being opened up. Of course, we had all these wonderful holiday houses and people that would, uh, you know, have holidays up in the Dandenongs. So they'd catch the train to Upper Ferntree Gully where the line originally started, and then they'd hop onto one of these little engines and they'd wander off into the Dandenongs and stay at uh, guest houses. Unfortunately, when the uh, development of roads got a little bit further advanced, people drove their cars up here rather than rather than caught the train and that began if you like the decline of this little railway to uh, to where uh, virtually the Victorian railways closed it off in the uh, late 1950s but you know with now with tourism we've actually started a renaissance we you know the little railway now again runs back to to uh, Jembrook unfortunately it can't run to Upper Gully because progress has bought the broad gauge from Upper Gully to Belgrave but we certainly run from Belgrave to Jembrook and uh, yeah, we, we're sort of re recreating the history that the railway would have had um, around the 1920s. All of the locomotives and rolling stocks designed to look just as it, it would have been in the sort of the, the heyday in the, in the 1920s. Just in front of me here, we have a diesel. As you know, I don't normally do diesels, but this is an exception. It's, uh, this is an exception to the rule. John, where did this come from? What's it doing here? Okay, this was formerly a a Tasmanian diesel that we re-gauged from three foot six to two foot six, so we bought the wheels in. Um, it's primarily a shunting engine, although in its in its earlier years it ran. We have what, out here what we call total fire bands in in Victoria, where we don't run steam. And this particular locomotive here was the forerunner of a couple of others that are outside, and they run during fire brand and special events. This thing is now primarily a shunting engine, um, and it's a uh, it's an eight-cylinder Gardener of about 280 horsepower. Um, it doesn't owe us a cent. It's been absolutely wonderful and reliable, and uh, yeah, just a, a classic piece of early English uh, diesel locomotive. John, can you tell us a bit about the building? Is, was this rebuilt or was this here? No, this was built by the uh, Preservation Society, 
and the board, the Emerald Terrace Railway Board. And if you can believe it, originally when we started, this was a combination running shed and workshop. Yeah. Uh, we very quickly outgrew that. And uh, about 15 years ago, we put the extension on the back with the overhead cranes. Eventually, my grand plan is that I will extend this particular smaller area, lift the roof and extend the whole thing all the way down so that we can have a travelling crane that goes from one end of the building to the other. But like so many other things around the place, and particularly I know it's an issue with all preserved railways in Australia, and I assume it's the same. Certainly, obviously. It's certainly. called the folding Fold green. green. The folding yeah. green. Yeah. Um, the unfortunate thing is that, uh, you know, we're always grateful for donations. The unfortunate thing is we can't get a lot of money from, from government. I, I could probably get on my political bandwagon here, but I'll behave myself. No, we'll behave ourselves. Uh, but the reality of life is, you know, everything ab about the place involves money, and without money, you go nowhere. Yeah. You, you really do have to appreciate and make a note of the people that do come here, and that you can see their importance to the community and also the upkeep of the buildings. You can physically see where your money is going. Well, an overhaul, just to point out something like an overhaul, can be anywhere between uh, 150 dollars and $200,000 for a locomotive. That's exactly the same amounts that we're facing in England with our steam engines. And a rebuild, I mean, if you look at that wonderful Garrett that we looked at earlier outside, I mean, $1.75 million to restore that. This is the funnel. You remember earlier on I mentioned you about being able to remove all of, all of this stuff here? Yeah. This is the funnel off 6A. Now, I also said that 6A is fitted with a Lempore exhaust. Yeah. Now, when you look across here, the standard Lempore exhaust is something shaped like this. And this we've designed to actually sit inside the funnel. So unless you're really attuned to what's going on, um, it doesn't quite have the same exhaust beat as a standard NA, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a Lempore exhaust, a modern innovation in, inside a 113-year-old steam engine. John, what's this piece of metal in front of us? This is the superheater header for the new NGG. We've just we've just recut the seats and generally cleaned it up, re-tapped the threads, um, and when we get round to fitting the boiler out further, this will be attached inside. Good.